just put 16 countries up here that have a variety of policy from stating on the website from the health ministry, we recommend reducing exposure. Some have incredible policy, which I'm going to talk about. Now, on the, the, our, the EHT website, too, I'll note, we try to keep track of the changes in the websites because that's very interesting. So, um, for example, Finland changed, changed its advice. The UK changed its advice. The United States, which I don't have on here, actually uh, changed its advice as well. In which ways did they change? Oh, well, sometimes they down. They, they say, we really recommend uh, reducing exposure, like the CDC said, along with other co countries, we recommend caution with cell phone use. And then within a few months, it disappeared. Now there was also a statement on there about children, about the vulnerability of children and that they, if in the long term, the effects may be greater for them. That statement disappeared. And then it said, if you are worried, we recommend uh, if you are worried, here's how you can reduce exposure. No one wants to be worried. I don't want to be worried. You read that and you go, ah, I don't want to be worried. I'm not going to be worried. So um, I want to just say personally, as a mother, when I first learned about this, I went out. I contacted every elected official. I contacted the Department of Health. I contacted the Department of Education. And I found out that... Everyone said they were not responsible or they didn't understand it, much like in Israel here. I also, uh, they said, well, go to the FDA. The FDA says that there's not a problem. I contacted the FDA and I said, when did you last do a transparent, uh, systematic review of the evidence to say such a statement, to have, to have the Department of Education and other departments tell me this? And in the end, after many letters and conversations, was told that actually there had been no systematic review because that's not what they do. Um, in regards to this, and the FCC uh, is setting the regulations. So um, I just wanted to say that it seems like also in raising this issue and in hearing all the science that we've heard this week, there's more concern for panic prevention than for public health protection <clears throat> because it is everywhere is not how we make public policy and when I talk about this issue people say to me but it's everywhere and I say yes and our children are everywhere <laughs> you know I mean and there are things that have been everywhere that have been really harmful for us and right now there are things that are everywhere that we really need to deal with in a thoughtful way so I finally made my way to the Maryland State Children's Environmental Health and Protection Advisory Council. There are 19 members. Um, their purpose is to identify hazards that may affect children's health and recommend solutions. There are pediatricians, toxicologists, epidemiologists, and representatives from the Department of Health, Department of the Environment, Department of Agriculture. I don't know if you have something similar to this, but it was a wonderful model of a lot of agencies, including representatives from the, um, the, the Maryland State Congress, and the Maryland governor appoints about half of them, that come together and their purpose is children's environmental health and commenting on legislation, what do we tell pediatricians, and they started working on this issue, um, and it took many years, actually, but just before I came here, we had a vote, they had a vote, and a lot of uh, parents came um, to testify and they issued, it's the first state body, the advisory council body, to issue recommendations recommending limiting exposures as much as feasib feasibly practical. They said the Maryland State Department of Education should consider using wired devices and if a new classroom is to be built, network cables can be added at the same time, providing wired access. And I think this is really important to think about moving forward. Yes, it's complicated to retrofit, to, to, uh, to change what's already in, although I feel it needs to be done. But if you're building new construction, then build it so that it's safe with wires, 
set up. And so the classroom is set up with the, the table set up so that there will be no tripping issues and it will look great and it will save a lot of money. And a lot of money in the cost to children's health. We need to keep that in mind. I, sometimes we just talk about money in terms of the infrastructure and the cables and the technicians, but when you look at the impact of lead or any other smoking on our health, I don't think there's a comparison to how much it would cost just to put the cables in. And I can tell you that many parents, including myself, have gone to schools and said, we will pay. We will pay to put in safe technology in our schools, in the, in the private schools. And sadly, many of us have been told no, despite saying that. Um, so uh, previous to the council's vote and recommendations, there are three U.S. public schools that um, have, ish, have policy on reducing Wi-Fi by introducing best practices for tablets and for uh, laptops. Turn off the device when not in use, turn the Wi-Fi on only when needed, and always place the, the mobile device on a solid surface. Ashland, Massachusetts was actually the first uh, school district to do this. And here is Baltimore County Schools, which is right in my neighborhood. And this is actually on their website about their tech department. And you see the device is right on her lap. And this is just a little it excerpt, a clip from a video they have talking about how wonderful the program is. This is St. Augustine School in Italy in 2014, um, taking down the router. Uh, education commission, the Education Commissioner is disconnecting it, and it's sort of uh, ceremonious. And I think this is wonderful um, just to see. They're, they're thankful. They, they are uh, celebrating taking down the router and protecting children's health in the long run. So I thought I'd put that up. And also, we have on the EHT website a list of the many schools. And if, if you're a school or you know a school that has removed Wi-Fi, we're trying to have a list of the private schools as well. There are many best practices that have been developed. So if people say, well, how do I do it? We heard from Reuven uh, how to do it, we had to use the wires. We, and then there's the best practices in the United States of the Collaborative for High Performance Schools that has low EMF criteria, which includes not just wireless, but also ELF to address the, um, the wiring issues in the school, which would, of course, be wired network, Ethernet port on devices, and um, correcting wiring problems, and wired phones in the classrooms for security. So Belgium, and I, there's a quote here from the Superior Health Council, experts, including those in the Superior Health Council, advise everyone to limit their exposure to mobile phone radiation. It's very, very well said. There's a ban on the sale of mobile phones for young children under seven years old a total advertising ban on cell phones aimed at children. And if you go into their Q&A on the legislation, you can see the pictures of these phones, which are developed for young children that are banned. They also have a warning label on phones. Think about your health. Use your mobile phone moderately. Make your calls wearing an earpiece and choose a set with lower SAR value. And they make the recommendations. But here, I'm showing the swipe and feed. So this. Is, I'm trying to show a contrast between the Belgium law and something that just came out where the parent, it's actually a plastic contraption, and then you can, you know, you can check your email and everything you need while you're feeding the baby. It's, now, a, holder for it, right? it's, a, it's holder. a holder for the phone. Um, yes, auto. yes. Connected to the phone. And you won't be able to miss, right. Right. And one, there are so many concerns about this, I could talk for hours. But I would like to just point out that in addition to the radiation emissions that are going right to the heart of the baby, impacting the heart, there is the issue of that when the baby is born, they can only see between the breast and the eye. And that's for a reason. You're, you're, con you're holding your baby, you're looking at your baby, and you're developing the attachment. And here, you see, the mama is not looking at the baby. And I think if you have a phone and you're looking at it, you're not looking at the baby. So in Taiwan, because of the incredible rates of internet addiction and, inter and uh, babysitting from these devices, they have a complete ban on children under the age of two from using electronic devices. Parents can be fined 
uh, about 1,600 U.S. dollars. Okay, and and they have they talk about using the devices for a reasonable amount of time. So they're really starting to put forward this awareness of being moderate because what's happened if anyone said five years ago do you think ten-year-olds should have a cell phone oh. at least in the United States people would go oh no ten-year-olds shouldn't have a cell phone that's for when you're an older maybe you know in the high school but but yet here we are so this is um, an image actually this is from 2011 in France a poster for a public awareness campaign now since that time, they have been quite at the, the progressive in this. In 2011, they, issued, they had a cell phone statute where merchants must display the phone SAR, phones must be sold with a headset, and there's a ban on cell phone ads for children younger than 14. Um, now, most recently in 2015, they passed policy where they banned Wi-Fi from nursery schools and Wi-Fi routers must be turned off in the classrooms unless in use specifically for purposes by that teacher for the amount of time while the teacher is teaching it. And of course the teachers should have wired uh, computers for themselves. They also label Wi-Fi hotspots. So you have public awareness. You know I'm walking into a Wi-Fi hotspot, which is really important for pregnant women as well as children, as well as all of us. Cell tower antenna ma maps. Towns with cell towers, well, they all have, most of them have cell towers. They can request the levels of radiation to know what they're being exposed to because most of us don't even know what we're being exposed to. Um, I can say in, in my town when parents ask, because they're putting towers up on all our schools, um, well, what's the radiation level going to be? There's an outside consultant who comes in via the company that's leasing it on their timetable. Generally, we never get a number unless we press, press, and press to know how much radiation is the person standing on the ground getting. Because most of us don't even know that they are even getting any exposures. And your work is so important because that's what you were looking at, Dr. Belpoge, is these low-level environmental exposures. Um, now, and then, they have, the France has the National Agency for Health and Security of Food, Environment, and Law, uh, and labor, also called ANSYS, and their most recent report that just came out a few months ago says that all wireless devices, including tablets, cordless phones, um, baby monitors, Wi-Fi toys, should be subject to the same regulatory obligations in terms of control and exposure levels as those governing <coughs> mobile phones. But, yeah, oh, so this, you guys all know Wi-Fi Barbie? Oh, well, this is a, a Barbie doll that is um, wirelessly connected, and it talks and it listens um, to you, and you can talk into it. And, and oh, and there's a whole other issue, which is another talk about privacy issues, because they're finding that people can tap into the Barbie and then listen to everything that's happening, just like people tap into your computer and can turn it on and, and listen to what's happening. So there's... You can just look that up, Wi-Fi Barbie, and uh, learn more about that. So they also talk about, the, they continue their very strong recommendations that the limits for radio frequency should ensure large safety margins to protect the general population, particularly children. Oh, and really importantly, that reliance on the SAR, which as we know is not a, a useful metric for understanding your exposure when you're buying a phone, um, that that be replaced with adequate, an adequate, a more adequate metric. In the United States, after the National Toxicology Program released its results, finding increased tumors, they issued, and these are um, website pages, 10 safety tips for cell phones. Um, and wireless, and there's a page on healthychildren.org, which is the American Academy of Pediatrics um, for, for the population who wants to look up something about their baby, a page on these 10 tips, and also they responded with a, a press release article um, where the Dr. Lowry, who's chair of the Council on Environmental Health of the American Academy of Pediatrics, stated, they're not toys. They have radiation that is emitted from them and the more we can keep them off the body, 
and use the phone in other ways, it will be safer. And their tips um, include everything we know well, but also, really important one, if you plan to watch a movie on your device, download it first, then switch to airplane mode while you watch it in order to avoid unnecessary exposure. So in, in Maryland, where I'm from, um, we, the new legislation has been introduced to develop medical guidelines for computer use in school. And I just want to quote Cindy Eckert, a parent who brought, who really raised this issue. I was shocked to learn that the Department of Education had no medically sound guidelines in place before they put so many children in front of a computer every day. And that's something to think about is guidelines in terms of the eyes, in terms of posture, in terms of the radiation having to do with children and screens. The other issue it has to do with the life cycle, like uh, Richard Laster was talking about, of these devices. Um, how are we? How are they being recycled? In most cases, they are being informally recycled by children, who are being poisoned by the chemicals that are in the pieces that they are taking apart. So all of these screens that we're using, in, a, in an unfettered way, are contributing to e-waste. And also, there's the issue of who held the phone before you. What are the the items in this? In, in the phone or the tablet. So this is from um, cobalt mining in the Congo, of which I, estimates are five and a half million people have died um, over the last 20 years, fueled by the, um, the mining for these, these minerals, conflict minerals, which you've probably heard of, which we're, uh, people are working on addressing, but the issue, <laughs> it gets really complicated with the companies coming back and saying, well, I can't figure it out. I'm trying to make sure that the chain is um, one that is not involved in exploiting people. Um, we haven't done a good enough job of ensuring that what's in our devices um, is not, does, not have this, does not have really blood on, on the hands. And I also have the makers of the, the workers who are putting together the chips just came out that Samsung had, uh, I think there were documented of leukemia, lymphoma, and other health issues related to the workers who are doing the chips with benzene. And so the manufacturing of these devices needs to be addressed. So we need to think really thoughtfully about, about how we're using our technology and, and, how, and what we expect and ensuring that we get it um, from sources where we've dealt with these issues. I just wanted to end with the Children's Environmental Health Network quote. Um, they have a wonderful blueprint for protecting children's environmental health. You can go online to find it. I'll, I can give you the link. We believe that it is our moral obligation to protect and nurture our children's health. And health is a state of physical, um, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease. Thank you very much. Thank you.